Poverty is not destiny, but it does place a significant children at, at greater risk for physical problems, uh, such as low birth weight, uh, poor nutrition, poor motor skills, and more accidents and injuries. Uh, also cognitive difficulties, such as poor academic performance, especially among younger children, and higher dropout rates in high school. Uh, social and emotional problems, such as anxiety, difficulty, getting along with peers and adults, and, and low self-esteem. Behavioral problems, such as engagement in high-risk activities like smoking, alcohol, and drug abuse, and early sexual activity, leading to higher rates of teen pregnancies. Uh, also, challenges in adulthood, such as poor health, lower earnings, higher poverty rates, and more criminal behavior. The uh, citations for all these are located in the report. Uh, and also, what's important to consider when we're looking at poverty is timing, depth, and duration. The children that are most harmed by poverty are people that are, are children that are in deep poverty. So we're talking about 50% of the federal poverty level, which is about uh, 9,000 for a family of three. Uh, and also children that are in persistent poverty or in counties that have persistent poverty over the years. People that aren't moving in and out but are persistently poor are incredibly more vulnerable. And also uh, poverty during early childhood has a greater impact on outcomes and I think that's why we've sort of seen this discussion about uh, uh, pre-early uh, pre, uh, education programs. Uh, you know, Governor Tomlin's talked about that. So paying attention to the early childhood is the most important. And also, children of color in West Virginia experience poverty and persistent poverty and early childhood poverty at higher rates than white children. So these are some of those implications. Uh, some of the other implications are the costs. Uh, you know, recent estimates suggest that, a gro that growing up in poverty in the U.S. costs about $500 billion annually. This was a study by a couple of academics in the form of foregone earnings, invest involvement with crime, and the costs associated with poor outcomes. So in effect, this amount of money is the, what would accrue to the U.S. if poverty were eliminated. We would, the, in West Virginia, we'd see about, they're estimated about $3.9 billion. So if somebody asks, what does it cost the state of West Virginia? This is a, a first run estimate, about $3.9 billion. And also, it's, you know, it contributes to severe overcrowding of the state's prisons, uh, the substance abuse epidemic in the state, high, obe high obesity. Uh, we talked about the uh, high teen birth rate. Uh, last week, and also concerns about dropping out of school. Uh, and one of the big concerns of this legislature during this session is uh, uh, looking at education. Uh, and one of the things that struck me when we started looking at education, my thought was, well, let's look at child poverty and, ed and education outcomes. What this chart does is look at the negative relationship between child poverty and reading level across U.S. states in 2011. So the reading level scores are from the National Assessment of Education Progress and are based on random samples of students in each state, uh, while the state poverty rates are from the American Community Survey. As you can see, there's a strong negative correlation. This isn't a regression. It's not holding things constant, but there is a strong negative correlation. You can see West Virginia down at the bottom. We have high poverty and low educational reading skills. So the states like Massachusetts that have low poverty I have high, better, much better reading skills. This isn't a causation, but it does show you that there is a relationship there. Uh, and one thing that sort of struck me about last week is sometimes we talk about poverty, but we're not sure exactly what we're talking about. Uh, you know, in terms of poverty and childhood poverty, basically we're talking about the adult's income. What are their wages and income? Uh, when it comes to the federal poverty threshold and guidelines, we're talking about the cost of a minimum adequate diet multiplied by three and adjusted for the CPI. Uh, and this was developed in the 60s and it was supposed to never be really used to show exactly what it takes to get by. Uh, so when we're talking about poverty in these official statistics, we're not talking about what it takes to get by. We're talking about barely scraping by and the need for a social safety net to even get, even to make a difference. Uh, there's also been movement to create a supplemental mental poverty measure that looks at uh, geographical differences includes health care costs, uh, tax credits, works co work costs, non-cash benefits, and tax assets. So it's a, and this is something the National Academy of Arts and Sciences has worked at for years. That, uh, that We haven't adopted that as the, at the federal level, uh, but there's a movement towards looking at a better comprehensive measure of what we're talking about. Uh, probably the best measure, I think, is the West Virginia self-sufficiency standard that West Virginia put out back in 2009. I believe they put it out previously. I believe the Workforce West Virginia is planning to put that out again this year. And what it does, it calculates the income that working families need to meet their basic necessities without private and public assistance. So what does a mother with two children, 
one in a, uh, an infant and one in preschool need to get by without any help from uh, public assistance programs. Uh, we talked a little bit about deep poverty and uh, uh, you know it's 50 percent of the FPL so it's another way to look at this question of how we measure our family's finances uh, and also low income just because you're not in poverty but if you're above it also you're uh, in serious uh, dire straits for deprivation in terms of income as well you can't afford child care health insurance that's why these programs like chips and the child care subsidy go beyond 100 percent of the poverty level uh, so this is just to give you an idea this is the annual income for a family of three in West Virginia uh, in 2011, so the median family income in West Virginia for a family of three was about $54,000. And if we look at the 200% of poverty level, what we were calling low income, uh, that's about $37,000. Uh, and we look at the West Virginia self-sufficiency standard for a three-person family in Kanawha County, it's about $36,000. So I always use a rough twice the poverty level is what it takes to get by in West Virginia. If you want to figure out exactly what it takes to get by without child care assistance and these different programs, you need to be at at least twice the poverty level. So it's a good yardstick. And you can see the federal income poverty level for a family of three uh, is about 18,530. So it's well below that. It's half of what it takes to get by. Uh, and deep poverty is about $9,000. Uh, almost half of our children in West Virginia that are in poverty, of the 90,000 uh, children under age 18, 45% are in deep poverty. Uh, so that's a huge issue, not only uh, in this state, but around the country. Uh, and that's something we really should target uh, because these children are the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. Uh, and about half of all children in West Virginia are, are in low-income families. So that's another thing to keep in mind when we look at these different levels of family finance. Uh, this was talked about at the last meeting, too. Uh, so under six, three in 10 uh, children under age six in West Virginia are in poverty. It's a little bit above the national rate and about one in four children under 18 are in poverty in West Virginia. And you'll notice too that the poverty rate for uh, the working age population is slightly lower at 18.5. And 65 and older, we have made the most progress, uh, not only in West Virginia, but around the country, you'll see a much lower poverty rate, about 10%. Uh, one question too that was talked about, I think uh, the last presenter talked about, what is, who is more likely to be in poverty? Well, 63% of children whose parents do not graduate from high school are in poverty. Uh, single mothers, half of all single mothers in West Virginia are in poverty, which I thought was a pretty amazing statistic, uh, amazingly bad. Uh, and about 42% of African American children are in poverty. That's about double what it is uh, for their white counterparts. And 71% of children have unemployed parents. So this can sort of help you, guide you a little bit as a committee to look at how we solve some of these problems. Uh, so what areas have uh, higher chi child poverty rates? Uh, the child poverty rate in, for this map was about 24% compared to the national average of about 20%. Cert some counties, only non-counties in West Virginia had child poverty rates lower than the national average. Almost all of these counties, except Putnam County, were located in the northern part of the state uh, that had lower poverty rates. So we're seeing the higher poverty rates in the southern part and the central part of, the, of uh, West Virginia. Uh, where are poverty, where, what areas have more young children in poverty? What this does is look at the share of children in poverty that are under age six. So you'll see in a couple counties there, like Clay, Calhoun, and Doddridge, uh, where uh, more than half of young children, those children under six are in poverty. And in Gilmer County, two thirds, according to the American Community Survey, of children under age six are in poverty. So those are some really desperate situations in those counties. Uh, and the child poverty, one thing we have to keep in mind, uh, especially this happened during the 80s recession in West Virginia, which was the worst recession the state I think has ever had. Uh, but poverty rises obviously with recession due to increase in unemployment, drop in earnings, <laughs> lack of wage growth. Uh, so we saw that uh, nationally, uh, child poverty grew from 18 to 22 percent, and in West Virginia it grew from about 23 to 25 percent. So the recessions, when they happen, make it very difficult uh, uh, for low-income families and increases child poverty. And it's hard at the state level to do a lot because you're fiscally constrained in many ways to react to that. But the automatic stabilizers at the federal level, like unemployment insurance, food stamps, can help those families. Uh, uh, and this is one of the charts that really uh, helped provide a foundation for the report we did. 
Uh, what you can see is that in 1969, the child poverty rate in West Virginia was about 19.1%. And in 1979, it was even lower at 15.5%. Uh, and then now it's gone back up to about 23.2%. And take a look at that 65 and older. 1969, almost 40% of seniors in West Virginia were in poverty. Today, that's about 10%. So the big takeaway here is this isn't inevitable. While it's going to require federal involvement as well, but states have a huge role to play too, but it's not inevitable. We can bring down poverty. We did it for seniors, and I think it's possible to do it uh, for children as well. Uh, this map looks at uh, persistent poverty. The uh, USDA uh, does an a analysis every couple years on which counties have been persistently poor. And they've defined persistently poor as which counties have 20% or more children under 18 that are in poverty. So these counties in West Virginia uh, have been over 20% over the last four decades. Uh, those are some, that can cause some major structural problems uh, in those areas. Uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with a lack of uh, investment, uh, has to do with higher unemployment rates, lower insurance rates. Uh, those, most of these counties have uh, less population growth than the other counties. Uh, so. It's just good to track it, which counties are persistently poor, which are moving in and out, like Boone County's been able to move in and out of poverty. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is sort of a list of some potential causes of child poverty. There are probably hundreds and hundreds of causes, and I wouldn't be up here trying to say exactly what each of those are, uh, but I think one of the most significant ones, obviously, is a lack of an educated workforce, uh, which means low-paid jobs in general. And probably the most important factor, if I could look at one statistic, and we'll look at it here in a second, is the stagnant wage growth for middle and lower income families in West Virginia. And the uh, gender gap in earnings uh, is certainly something women make far less than men do, even controlling for education and other factors. Uh, and also changes in the family structure over the last couple of decades have, dramatic, have increased poverty. Uh, when you look at this, I thought this was really, this is, uh, this is looking at the percent of workforce with a bachelor's degree in West Virginia. That little red dot down there is West Virginia. Uh, only about 23%, uh, 23.9% 23 uh, of West Virginia's workforce had a college degree compared to the national average of about 32%. And what you do, what you see here is a strong relationship, uh, not a causation, but a relationship between wages on the left, that's the median hourly wage, in 2011 and the percent of uh, workforce with a bachelor's degree. And this is 2011. And what that, that sharp line shows that there's a really strong relationship, a high, a strong correlation uh, between the two. But that wasn't always the case. And if you look at this slide, the next one, you can see this is the, the, the link between education and wages in 1980. So in West, in West Virginia, for instance, West Virginia had higher wages than most states in the country in 1980 because they had a very industrial workforce that were involved in more blue collar type economic activity. And as we've moved into a service sector, having that education matters more and more and more. Uh, but before we were able to get away with not having that educated workforce uh, as compared to other states. But today, it's, it's, that's why we rank so low in wages uh, because we don't have uh, the educated workforce. Because with educated, the more education you have tends to increase wages. Uh, Next one. This is the really chart that's really the telling story. If I could push one chart on everybody to sort of examine poverty in West Virginia, if I had to think of one thing that is the central cause of it, it would be this. Uh, this is real median wage growth in West Virginia from 1979 to 2011. Uh, this is adjusted for inflation in 2009 dollars. What this shows is that the typical worker in West Virginia, the one in the middle of the wage distribution uh, made about $16.14 per hour in 1979. And today, after just adjusting for inflation, not productivity, which that would be very different, uh, is lower today than it was in 1979. So more people are having to get into the workforce, work longer hours. Now more women are getting into the workforce to make up for this wage growth. And this can have huge problems with marriage. We talk uh, with family structure problems and finding a mate being able to have income and economic stability to have a good marriage and to have uh, and to put and to reduce poverty is very important. But if your wages aren't growing and if you're in a state that has very low wages, it makes it very difficult to uh, bring down poverty. 
And this is the uh, gender gap in wages uh, and earnings. This is from the American Community Survey. Uh, so the median earnings for females working full-time year-round in West Virginia is the second lowest in the country at about $30,000. Men fare a little bit better at about $42,000. And below you can see the median hourly wage in West Virginia for uh, men and also females. So when we're talking about the single mothers, you know, half of the single mothers are in poverty, this is, can be a, make it very difficult for them to get out of poverty because of this gender gap. Uh, uh, so moving away from there, uh, these are some of the programs and policies that are currently in place in West Virginia. Uh, and the goals of some of these policies are to increase family income and assets. Uh, that would include uh, TANF, uh, SSI, the Earned Income Tax Credit at the federal level, the uh, uh, Child Tax Credit, the Child and Care Dependent Tax Credit, and also the West Virginia Family Tax Credit, which was passed when Governor Manchin was here, part of the tax modernization, which uh, basically got rid of uh, income taxes for families that were in poverty. Uh, so that was definitely a move to help low-income build, people build assets. Also, improving access to essential goods and services, uh, Medicaid, CHIP, uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, WIC, uh, SNAP, uh, low-income home energy assistance programs, uh, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, these are all things that can uh, improve access to essential goods and services. Uh, and we also have programs that help promote human development of children and parents. We have the West Virginia Child Care Program, Head Start, uh, Title I, uh, the Home Visitation Program, and uh, the Workforce Investment Act, and the In-Home Family Education uh, Program, which is, I think, pretty successful. Uh, but all of those policies that we were looking at, that sort of formed the foundation of how we've addressed that over the last couple of decades, mostly at the federal level to deal with poverty. So the real question for the committee, too, is how we address this moving forward. I think it's important that we build leadership at all levels, and I think we're doing that right here today by being here, uh, setting a goal and working toward it. Many states have, what, have set benchmarks and said this, that we're going to try to reduce poverty by 50 percent over the next 10 years. There's a famous campaign called the Half in 10 program. Uh, part of the Center for American Progress has been working with states and legislators to do that. Also choosing priorities. We can't do everything, so we have to figure out exactly which program or service or what ways that we can work with the community people in the community to address the problem. And it's also important that we maximize current resources. There's tons of things that and programs that have federal eligibility limits that we could uh, increase to provide more access to the programs like child care assistance in many states goes up to twice the poverty level. We're here entry into the programs at about 150 percent of the poverty level. And we also can enact new policies and if we do that we need to ensure that we have good results, so good accountability to make sure that these policies that we're using are having an impact on poverty. Uh, just to show you that you're not alone, uh, 21 states uh, uh, have child poverty task force all around the country. Uh, some of them have been legislated and some of them have been through executive order. As you can see, our neighboring states of Ohio, Kentucky, and Virginia all have child poverty task force where people are sitting around just like in a meeting like today and talking about these things uh, and putting out reports uh, looking at the problem. So that's definitely a step that you could look to move forward with. Uh, and one of those other issues, one of the policy issues that I think that uh, that there seems to be a consensus around in this state and also nationally from the president to the governor is investment in early, child, early childhood programs. Uh, and what we found is this can really play a huge role making investments in these high quality uh, early child care programs for three and four year olds, it can reduce teen parenting rates, uh, it can reduce the amount of health problems uh, kids have later in life. And this, this, is, a, this is from the Brookings Institute. Uh, these are a number of the, the studies that have been done in the Perry Preschool and, and uh, the Chicago Ch uh, Child Parent Centers uh, that we've heard about. You've heard that famous sort of seven to one, every dollar we invest in early childhood development brings back seven dollars that comes from one of these studies where that figure comes from. But we know, and this is looked at a control group and the groups receiving the care, and these are mostly low income children that were involved in these programs. So. The ability to be able to, to demonstrate that these programs over 40 years had a huge impact on teenage parenting, health problems, a decrease in drug use, a decrease in abortion, a decrease in treatment for addiction, uh, and also the number of felony uh, violent assaults, and also net earnings down the road. 
Uh, and this is something that's been studied time and time again over the last couple of decades. And this is really truly the best uh, research out there on really breaking that chain of poverty and moving, getting social mobility, making sure the kids that happen to be in poverty don't grow up and remain in poverty early, later on.